everybody. My name's Sarah McDougall. I'm director of Benary Gallery Museum. And I'm really delighted and privileged to be here this evening with Michelle Franklin, who's one of our artists in the Benary collection. Her work's been in the collection um, since the 1980s, I think. That's yes, right. Quite a long time. Yes. And a more recent work joined it uh, about perhaps five years ago. Yeah. Um, so this evening I'm really privileged to have Michelle here and what we have uh, on display here really is a mini retrospective of Michelle. So um, I think everybody here is also privileged to be able to see this whole span of Michelle's work from her earliest work. I think we even have a work from your um, sixth form days. Yeah. Uh, very early still life over on the far wall there and that's flanked by two fantastic portraits that Michelle did very early in her career. On the left is the girl in a pink shirt which she actually did in the summer holidays before she went to Camberwell School of Art. Can you imagine being able to do that before you'd actually gone to art school? <laughs> and then on the right we have one of my favourites which is an early self-portrait that Michelle did at the age of 18, where she's exploring different parts of her own heritage, uh, which we'll touch on in a moment, and also her artistic aspirations and heritage as she works through the language of the modern. And so tonight we're going to just have a look at these various phases of Michelle's career, so the different themes and motifs that she treats in her work, we're going to talk a little bit about her practice, and a little bit about her inspiration, both artistic and the sort of things she has been reading recently, which have also been very fruitful in terms of starting her on a new part of her work. So I'm going to speak a little bit and ask Michelle questions, and then when we come to a natural pause, we're going to throw it open so that you can all ask the questions you've been dying to ask Michelle all these years. I've never done <laughs> before. <laughs> so Michelle. We start right back at the beginning. Uh, your family, obviously, we have lots of your wonderful family tonight and are very important in your work as well. And over here in the middle, we have two fantastic portraits, one of your father and one of your mother, Beverly. I think everybody here will know, but in, in case they don't, I think it would be good to speak a little bit about their background and um, the really amazing photograph and the piece that um, one of your sons found about your parents' marriage from a college newspaper um, and what light they throw both on those portraits and on the enduring inspiration they see in your work. Uh, yes, well, the, when I found the tin photograph that you see there of the great great grandparents, um, I think great 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 actually. <laughs> um, I asked my mother about it and she she was very vague and didn't know much, but she said, you know, he was African American, she was Native American Indian, and that's all she knew. Um, she did research her life and actually went to Canada. Um, a few years before she died with my, my sister and they researched and found some relatives graves there as well. So it's, um, it, it's a fascinating history particularly to us because um, throughout our lives our mother, um, which she would always say I'm, I am a, a black American, African American with Native American Indian uh, in me from you know <laughs> many generations past but she was very proud of those things. And also, because she grew up as a black woman in America, she knew a lot about racism. She, in fact, has written a book about her life, which includes many of these incidents. So as her children, we were very aware of these things. But of course, we slotted very well into a middle-class white society, where hardly anyone of Caucasian descent would ever guess our origins. That is, until they would meet my mother. And of course, there would be many different reactions to that. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's a, another another story, really. But um, we, because of our background, I always felt it was important to include it in my work. So I didn't realise when I painted the self-portrait when I was 18 that I would look 
quite so mixed res, but my hair, when it's short, is an afro. And I, I didn't realise that either until I cut my hair really short. And I had this afro, and I just identified with keeping my hair short. And that was how I looked for quite a few years when I was at college, as Julie will remember how that's, you know, when we were at college together. Um, and uh, later on in life, um, I was close with both my parents. So my father's Jewish background and life as a peace protester were also very important in our lives and he was always talking about that and doing things about it and he came from this incredibly eminent Jewish family who had achieved many things which you can read in the brochure because there are too many to talk about now. <laughs> and um, so when I painted my parents I wanted to tell some of their stories and um, I remember this poster that my father had in his attic and I remember seeing that poster as a child saying, no more Hiroshima's. And we knew what that meant because he had talked to us all the time about, um, he was a pacifist and, you know, the horror that, that those situations had created. And of course, I went to a school in Golders Green, so I was very aware of the Holocaust and those, um, those stories, the people who uh, I knew had come from the backgrounds of that, those atrocities. So that was all part of who I am, and obviously it still is. Um, with my mother's portrait, I don't think she was really happy, but I decided that I was going to put Martin Luther King in the background because it was important to me to tell her story. And I think she probably wanted more of a straight kind of beautiful portrait, <laughs> but it didn't come out quite like that. But you know, we talked about it later, and when she was writing her own um, biography, autobiography, um, I said, you know, this is such an important part of who you are and how I remember you. So um, that those that's kind of the background of um, of the family and. You know, when I married, I painted my husband and children quite a bit as well, but they, they couldn't fit in the show, I'm afraid. But there is one of them over there, my son, Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a real life person. Um, and um, shall I carry on? Do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're both going to go on for hours. We do want you to carry on, but I'll just. <laughs> so I think also that circles right back to how your parents met. They meet on a civil rights march. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, and that's a, a fantastic uh, piece that, uh, is it Gabriel's found from the college newspaper? Yes, well, that yes. was uh, uh, from, just, Jet, Jet. from Jet uh, magazine. Yes, well, when he, he came to me and he said, Don't look what I found, Mum. And I thought, Oh, he's been messing around with the computer again, so <laughs> <laughs> and, and And it was just this extraordinary photograph of my parents' wedding. So we were all uh, astonished and, and when it, it, you know, we read this article, we realised just, my mother would always tell us how unusual their wedding had been. And you know, her father hadn't wanted to come to the wedding because he didn't like white people because he would had to put up with them for so long and hadn't had good experiences. <laughs> and um, so, it, you know, they, as a couple, they'd gone off to probably quite a tumultuous start. But um, that article really brought it all home to us. And the, also the fact that my father, people always say, well, how did his Jewish family react? But it wasn't, you know, he was in a very privileged position. His Jewish family were actually very welcoming to this woman of colour. But it was her family who were really taking the risk. And eventually, obviously, my grandfather accepted the situation and we all grew up knowing him. But, um, it, it was a huge step for him to take, and his daughter was so, um, you know, she'd become such a rebel, really, from the society that she left. And, um, you know, just a simple thing like uh, being told she should go to a university for her people. And um, anyone of colour knows what that means. So <laughs> she said, I'm... Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to university in North America because that's where I've grown up, but discovered there was a quota for two out of 200 black, Jewish or Irish people. And she did get into university and did very well, but that's just one example of the kind of life 
that she was used to, that she, you know, she, she negotiated her way through. And I think in a lot of ways her life was probably uh, less difficult living in a middle class white society when she was <laughs> with, a, with my father's, um, well put it like this, that, that they were, they were very, um, I, maybe because they were Jewish, but they were very accepting of someone who didn't belong. And I think that's a feeling that you often have as a person of colour or as someone who just lives in a society where you are not the norm, the so-called norm. Very interesting. So uh, we've talked a bit about that side of your heritage and exploring that through your work. And then uh, you touched on, just worth mentioning briefly, uh, your father's uh, extensive eminent um, ancestors and cousins and so forth. And of course they included uh, the pioneering molecular scientist Rosalind Franklin on yes. the one hand, and he himself was this is this, wasn't he? Yes. Um, and then on the other, um, Miriam Israels or Garbo. And so um, I know that he and she were both early inspirations for you, especially her. And I wondered if you wanted to just very briefly tell us a bit more about that, because I think it's really interesting that we've had these two sides to your work and your character and your heritage, which have been there from the very start, and then they have fed into everything you've done artistically. So just a little bit about Miriam, perhaps, because she's the less well-known, but I know it was her in particular who inspired me. Yes, um, well, Miriam was my father's mother, and um, she actually divorced his father after 10 years of marriage and then went to America where she met the sculptor who became very well known called Norm Garber, a Russian constructivist. But my memories um, as a child of her are, first of all, actually the embroidery, which you, you could see my new, new, newish embroideries because that's a, um, a passion that I have sort of been working on more recently. But she introduced me to that. She was in it. Uh, she, she did embroidery and she did smocking. But predominantly, she was a very good painter. And I grew up with her still lives. Um, my parents had her work in the house, and um, she was really for her um, era as well. She was very modern. She painted a lot with a knife. She was uh, quite a rebel as well. At um, I think she only went to art college for about a year. But we would talk about painting and. We always just had that connection to do with um, making a good painting. And I can remember being in uh, Garbo's studio one time. They lived in Connecticut in America. And, and she said, oh, Michelle, you, know, you, can, you can go and use the studio because he'd passed away by then. And so I started doing this painting of a flower thinking, I really don't think this is very good. You know, um, there's just something wrong here. <laughs> so I, um, I brought her in and said, you know, what do you think, Grandma? And she said, no, Michelle, this isn't good. So <laughs> I said, oh, okay, I, I didn't think it was going the right way. <laughs> but like most artists, when you're making art, you always want it to be good. But actually, it's never good unless you really work hard at it. And quite a lot of the painters here have seen a lot of um, bad temper, shall we say, <laughs> to get them to the stages that they're at. So, um, yeah, fun memories. So let's um, continue back sort of from the early years. So we, we'll get you to Camberwell, where you meet fellow painter Julie Health, <laughs> among others, who is with us this evening. And um, so we're seeing the kind of work that you're doing there, but I know um, initially it was quite a, a difficult experience, particularly the sort of male authority figures there. <laughs> but you began to find um, inspiration and more of a home in the sculpture classes, which were of course taught by no less a figure than <laughs> Brian Taylor, the man who was to become your husband 10 years old. And I believe you said on the very first time you met that you would get married. Yes. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> um, well, I was quite, quite um, rebellious in the painting department and realised that all the tutors were male apart from one woman and they were really terrified of me and before I was even given a tutor I was relegated to the sculpture department because that's where they sent the rebels <laughs> so 
Um, and then I, yes, I met uh, Brian and, and I said, well, you know, we're supposed to be having a tutorial. And he said, oh, day by day, not today. And I said, well, you don't sound like you're in a black depression. Because someone had said to me, oh, he's in a black depression. So anyway, we both laughed. And I said, well, no, we are having a tutorial today. Because I've dragged my portfolio all the way down there. <laughs> so let's get on with it. <laughs> so we did. And he said, my dear, you really need to learn how to draw. <laughs> but he was right. And so I thought, well, you know, how am I going to do that in the painting department? I was so bored of their drawing classes. So I just took to the sculpture department classes, which were four hours, four till eight, two or three times a week. It was really quite grueling. But I, that's how I learned not so much how to draw, but how to think. Because that's how the sculptors, they think about space before they put a mark on the paper. And that kind of spatial thinking was not something I really understood. But I did learn to do it, and obviously I stayed in the sculpture department a bit more than I should have, because I decided I was going to marry Brian. And <laughs> he took some convincing. <laughs> we see the results of that application in those careful drawings, which are both precise but free as well. And actually, you, you haven't included any sculpture here, but you did do some very fine sculpture at that stage as well. Yes, in the early days. So then moving on from that, you went to um, Venice to do postgraduate course in etching. And there are a number of your etching here tonight. I see lots of red dots, so yes. they're going down very well with the public. Um, and one of the things I think that uh, always strikes me about your work is how the two sides of your personality um, also span two sides of your work. So to me it seems that the monochrome work, the drawings and the etching, often are reserved for those darker subjects which are mining really important parts of your and uh, universal history. So you've done a whole series on the Holocaust, for example, um, and then later things about tsunamis in particular and so on. And then the painting and the colourful side is more, to me, the brighter, optimistic Michelle who is the Michelle we often see in public. Uh, but just delving into those a bit, a bit further, did you want to speak about any of those series, such as the Holocaust one, and there's one or two etchings from that series tonight? Um, yes, well actually, um, the Holocaust series began with um, the film show which Julie and I went to see together. And that just gave me such an um, insight that into the Holocaust, how it had happened, the, the real people who were involved as opposed to just sort of knowing the history. And I started to explore it in a way, I was used to working from life, so I was used to having live models. And this was the first time I'd really diversified from that. I had to use my imagination, I used uh, video clips, I just found information, and I, any information that I could. Obviously, there are quite a lot of photographs if you look. Um, and I made them into stories in a way, I suppose. I mean, they were, you know, they, they are not meant to be pretty, and they are meant to be hard hitting because there, there's, uh, there are a lot of drawings as well, charcoal drawings which aren't here, but um, I just felt it was such an important thing to do, and I couldn't really stop doing it. So I just found more and more, uh, also with etching, it's very quite slow. So I could just draw and develop those etchings sort of in their own time. And I, I just found it a completely engrossing subject matter. I read lots of books about the Holocaust as well. And eventually I had to get rid of them because I knew I needed to move on. And um, I had done that series on the Holocaust before I had children. So I think I moved on because I got so annoyed about giving birth. And <laughs> as you see that article and, and a couple, I did, I don't know, quite a few pages on birth. And um, I just was so angry about the fact that nobody talked about birth and what it was really like. And um, so Women's Art published this, this article I'd written. And, um, then, of course, I was in the world of family and I painted my first child as a baby. And I 
I didn't really go into sort of child art in a big way, but um, I was lucky enough to be able to continue working in a studio in my home. So I probably had a lot less exhibitions in those days, but I always worked. So the still lives started developing then, I think, quite a lot. And my passion for artichokes. <laughs> <laughs> because some of the artichoke paintings are really old, and I've, some of them are really quite recent. But I, I just love the purple flowers, and, and I love the structure. And um, another thing that I sort of could probably just carry on painting forever. <laughs> Enduring fascination of the artichoke. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and the birth paintings that you did were, uh, you know, very original because, as you say, an ever present, everyday subject, but nobody was talking about it, nobody was addressing it, and you were brave enough to put that really painful aspect as well as the more joyful aspects of motherhood afterward. Um, I, on this wall, I can see we have a work, which I think this one is called Banishment, and we yeah. have uh, the work Banished in the Benuri collection, yeah. which is uh, related to that piece. <laughs> and here we see where you're taking inspiration from some of the old masters, so reminds us of Masaccio, of course. And around the corner, I know you have uh, a lovely piece, which is um, after a Degas, taking inspiration from a Degas. So, I know there are a lot of enduring painters through your career. Uh, Rembrandt and those one touch point, um, and there are others, Gwen John, and so on, for her portraits of women. So, I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about some of those inspirations. Um, well, yes, I have many inspirations. Um, Degas was probably one that I started really looking at when I was doing um, printmaking because uh, I, I did this uh, mon monotype um, which you do on glass in, in an attempt to really work in um, tones which he of course was a brilliant genius at turned out to be much more difficult than I thought <laughs> so um, I always, yeah, he's close to my heart and Rembrandt of course the greatest painter who ever lived in my view um, and there are so many, but um, you know, obviously, we now try to find the more and more women artists with whom I think it's quite interesting to identify because when they were painting, for instance, someone like Artemisia Gentileschi, I mean, they lived to us such a long time ago, but actually, their struggles were very often people like her, people like Mary Cassatt, an impressionist painter, but more so. Um, I, I know Mary Cassatt never married, and I know a lot of the, the women who did well in their careers as painters didn't, because obviously they couldn't if they were going to work, because the only other alternative was marriage. But also, um, the extraordinarily uh, unique work, yes, Gwen John's work, so um, painful in many ways, so honest, and um, really someone who has studied in great detail what she wanted to do and was, uh, you know, I would say worked a lot harder than her brother, <laughs> the, very, the more famous um, painter, who, who really um, is just a really good example, he didn't have to try in the way that she had to, and, and there are many others like her, but I do identify as a female artist um, just thinking about women's um, Themes, so starting really with birth, and um, you know, I, I put in some of the influences here on my latest uh, embroidery because Faith Ringgold, I think it's Ringgold, anyway, she um, is a very old lady, and I saw her exhibition, I don't know, maybe it was about <laughs> five years ago uh, at the Serpentine, but. You know, she couldn't get her work shown at all at her, at, you know, when she was young and it was very often, if you look here, the flag is bleeding, the, um, we came to America, I mean, these are quilts that she made and they are incredibly moving, but they're also very hard hitting images, you can't really miss the message. And she's talking about her life, you know, as a black woman in America. So that, those really left an impression on me as someone who, in her, in her youth and as a young artist had absolutely no support and then there was this huge exhibition at the Serpentine where you really saw a, a lot of interesting themes and she had a good sense of humour as well which I think is important to keep. <laughs>
But um, I, I don't um, differentiate in um, the influences on my work, if it's a man or a woman. It's really about the quality of what they do. So, um, for instance, in, um, we were talking about, uh, I do a lot of reading. And uh, when I read Monique Roffey's book, The Mermaid of Black Conch, it really hit, um, yes, it, it hit a chord with me. These are the two new unframed paintings because it's just a new project. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of it, but I've read, when I read the book, um, I was struck by the many things that she has cleverly interlaced into a really wonderful kind of fairy tale. But it's a modern fairy tale, and you have the you have the racism in Trinidad, you have the sexism of the woman, you have the abuse of this beautiful mermaid. And um, it, it's a fantastic story, but it's also a very powerful, um, I, I suppose, allegory, really. That's how I see it. So I'm working on this idea, but you may notice that my mermaid's got two tails. And that's because mermaids should be able to have sex. And this is really important. <laughs> with these male fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you circled us right round to the recent book, which is fantastic. And um, yeah, your inspiration is here, which, is a, which I think is a great um, thing to see. And how various they are, because that shows us how various the work is, and how you take these different points of inspiration to when they finish, like the Holocaust series, then they're finished, but you often take ideas or elements or motifs over from one series to yeah. another. So a kind of fascination you had with fire, then fed into the fascination with water. But we haven't really talked about those, um, but yeah. there's, of course, uh, the famous Hokusai wave here. Yeah. But I think also Jericho is the great inspiration for those pieces, the rock. Medusa. Yes, the raft, yeah, but the Raft of Medusa well, is probably the most fascinating painting to anybody who knows it. Um, his painting of water is, um, well, uh, I, I don't, you know, unrivaled is the word I would use. But uh, yes, it's a fascinating, powerful painting. And um, yeah, water is obviously it's a very emotional thing. So it's in, in some of the Holocaust pieces, it's based, that sort of fed into the tsunami work. And tsunami was something I started reading about and was also really interested in how I could create water in a print. So that's, that's kind of a bit of a technical problem to anyone who does it. And do you want to tell us a bit about that technical process? Because for the non-artists, those kind of things are very interesting. Um, well, for example, in, there's a print down here where you see uh, the women are, the hair has become almost part of the water in the image. And um, I wanted to use, um, well I think I did use a brush to try and sweep that ink across, but it's not so easy to do with an etching because with an etching you are basically, you're drawing into wax or you're drawing into metal, and I prefer you usually start by learning drawing into wax because you can um, you you can manipulate wax. Whereas once you draw with a sharp point straight into um, a copper plate, you, it's hard to eradicate that line. But that line that you make is very um, powerful, and it's also it it um, picks up ink in a particular way, and we call it it has a burr to it. So it has a kind of blurring edge but it has a deep black line in the middle. So if you have the confidence, as Rembrandt did on a regular basis, <laughs> to, um, to draw straight onto the metal plate, you can make really um, quite emotional images and also ones that are not in... Then, for instance, if you look at the reclining nude on your left as you come in, that is what I would describe as one of my first etchings. So it's a very graphic image. And it's not done by drawing straight onto a plate, it's drawn a lot with something called soft ground. And with that you roll different kinds of fabric through a press and they take an impression. And then the acid that you put the plate into bites through and, and creates the pattern that you have put onto your um, metal plate. 
I also used something on that called sugar aquatint, which was, um, aquatint is another way of making a kind of uh, powdery, um, uh, powdery tone in etching. But uh, as I got more confident, I got better at drawing with the, um, the, the metal point on the plate. And that's really what I prefer to do now, but it, you do have to scrape away quite a lot. <laughs> So perhaps we'll finish our discussion here with just talking about also part of your latest work and ongoing embroidery <coughs> that you've been doing. I know the first one, the cockerel on the top, was when you went originally on a course, I think a weekend course, and you said this was the sort of standard subject everyone was given to do. But of course you went at it in a completely <laughs> different way from everybody else. Um, and from that, we arrive at a work like this one. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Did it? Uh, Luchadora. Yeah. Um, so, which I know you did in Spain. So tell us a little bit about <coughs> that work, and then perhaps we'll open the floor to the audience after. Uh, well, yeah, as you can read, um, there's a little story here about why I started intentionally embroidery when I was in Spain looking after my brother. Because I couldn't paint, and uh, if I hadn't been able to do that, I don't know what I would have done. But I found um, it was a, um, it, it just means a lot to me, this embroidery, because, oh, first of all, the inspiration started with this Arthur Rackham's um, drawing, which, uh, and then I made my own design from it. But I always could see the image in my mind before I made it, and the trouble with that is that embroidery takes absolutely ages to do. So <laughs> I've been at it for a very long time. And then I, I felt that this woman who, to me, she is a mixed race woman, which you should be able to tell from her hair. So she kind of represents me. She's got uh, twin babies, because I think that's a sign of uh, a powerful woman and also a modern woman. There are many women who have multiple births these days because they're busy with their careers. So <laughs> she is. <laughs> and, um, and also she's, got her arms outstretched really saying, you know, look at me, I, I'm a woman of power, I can do whatever I want. And that's kind of who I am. <laughs> <laughs>